Thanks again to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. Pleasure to be here in, in Singapore for the, first, uh, for the first time. So we're going to switch gears slightly in the next 20 minutes or so and talk about uh, monitoring and trying to improve or preserve diaphragm function during uh, mechanical ventilation, thinking not, in a, in a, not instead, but in addition to ventilator-induced lung injury, thinking about ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. These are my disclosures. So I still like this, uh, this uh, an old uh, article now about the process of thinking about reasons why people ha fail to liberate from mechanical ventilation. And, and the fine print that you can't read there is a short list of, or partial list, of reasons why people develop diaphragmatic weakness. But the point here is that diaphragm dysfunction from multiple causes can be an important cause to, to weaning failure. Now, if you're going to measure the, the uh, muscles of respiration, there's all kinds of compli complicated ways to do it, as uh, outlined in this nice review by Leo Hunks's group here. The gold standard, if you asked a respiratory physiologist about measuring diaphragm function, would be to do supramaximal uh, magnetic twitch stimulation of the phrenic nerve, uh, as, sh as shown here, with a, both an esophageal and gastric balloon, which I think if you just started approaching our patients and families with these kind of magnets, they might get a little bit uh, concerned. Um, not very practical, but it has actually been done. Um, it, to, to their credit, uh, the group of uh, Alexandre de Moule in, in Paris have done this in patients right at, at uh, the start of mechanical ventilation and showed that on day one, in fact, many patients had diaphragmatic dysfunction and that impacted their ability to... Uh, to get off the ventilator. Let's first just review though, because I think we had concerns when we set out to start studying diaphragm dysfunction. We didn't think that doing this uh, twitch stimulation was going to be a practical way to really uh, to get a lot of answers. Remind ourselves that although we see the diaphragm mostly as a dome on the chest x-ray, the important working part of the piston that is the diaphragm is the uh, zone of apposition as shown here, which contracts and lowers the whole uh, thorax. So we thought about using ultrasound to, uh, to measure diaphragm function non-invasively. And historically, I think many of us have used ultrasound when we've had a very difficult to wean patient and we're wondering if there's total diaphragmatic paralysis and we'd look and see if there was excursion of the diaphragm when the patient was breathing spontaneously. But more recently, we've started looking at imaging the diaphragm using the linear array probe that we'd use to put in lines and looking at it in the zone of apposition to better characterize the muscle. And doing that, as you can see here, here's a cross section here. On the right side, there's good contrast with the, with the liver behind the, the, the diaphragm. And you can see the two shiny lines of the, of, the, uh, of the pleura nicely outlining the diaphragm there. So that tells you, just in a static measure, about the thickness or the bulk of the, uh, of the muscle. The cool thing is that you can do this under live imaging and see how much the diaphragm is contracting with each breath. So on the left side here in this video, you can see that as the patient breathes, just like when you flex your arm, your bicep thickens. When you contract your diaphragm, it thickens also. And in, when you put the line uh, through that red line in M mode and look at that over time, you can actually make pretty precise measurements of the changes in thickness that gives you an idea about diaphragm activity. So now, so using simple non-invasive measures, we have, an ex we have measurements of both muscle bulk and how it changes over time if we do serial measurements, and diaphragm activity, looking at the thickening fraction, how much the thickness changes with each breath. We first started out, started out just to see how, the, how this operated, and I'll tell you that we learned quite a few important things in this. The thickness of the diaphragm is different in different places and different angles. If you want to measure this serially over time, it's important to mark the exact spot that you're measuring. So we, when we're doing serial measurements in a patient, we'll have a little X marks the spot uh, side to this. And practically, it's much uh, more reliable and more consistent when you do this on the right side with contrast from the liver than trying to find on, on the left side. Now. There's lots of reasons why the diaphragm might be weak in our critically ill sick patients. From sepsis to electrolyte imbalances, critical illness, neuromyopathy, all these things 
may be present, but we also wonder how much is the way in which we're using the mechanical ventilator impacting on these, st uh, on these uh, findings. We know that in brain dead patients when there's absolutely no diaphragm ac activity, atrophy can occur very quickly. And interestingly, this is a nice study from, from Martin Dress. There's a separation though between, this is not just all critical illness polymyopathy that, polymyopathy that we see. They compared groups that had diaphragmatic weakness versus ICU acquired weakness. And while there was some overlap between the two, as you can see here, and maybe not surprisingly, those with diaphragm weakness had much more of an impact on weaning from mechanical ventilation, whereas ICU acquired weakness really didn't have that strong an effect. We think about ventilator induced diaphragm dysfunction through at least three mechanisms. Most commonly, and, and probably most best recognized, would be diaphragm quiescence causing, di causing uh, atrophy. But we also may see injury through excess muscle loading and also potentially through patient ventilator asynchrony where the diaphragm is doing eccentric contractions and is contracting while the patient's actually breathing uh, or the ventilator is breathing out for the patient. So we started off with a simple study just looking at what's happened to the patient's diaphragms over time while they're on the ventilator. And I'll just walk you through this because it's hard to point from this, uh, from this angle. In the middle of this graph is the green line, which was about 40% of patients where we, we measure the diaphragm every day and nothing really changed. In red, you can see another 40% of the patients that had a rapid and significant reduction in their diaphragm thickness, which is suggestive of atrophy. And then a little bit to our surprise, we found a third group which had a significant increase in diaphragm thickness over time. And, and more about that in a second. Now, what did this have to do with, with, their, uh, with their pattern of breathing? In this 3D graph here, the y-axis, the vertical axis, shows the, uh, the change in diaphragm, diaphragm thickness over time. The x-axis is the duration of ventilation, so over a, the course of a week. And the z-axis is going backwards, shows their diaphragm activity, the thickening fraction of the diaphragm. And so what you can see is in patients who had very little diaphragm activity, those are the ones who had a rapid reduction in diaphragm thickness, whereas those who had excess work and higher than normal diaphragm activity had an increase in their diaphragm thickness. Put another way, here's a, here's a figure showing changes in diaphragm thickness correlating to average driving pressure in the first three days of uh, ventilation where those with the highest driving pressure on the vent had the biggest loss of diaphragm thickness and those with very low driving pressures had increasing thickness. So we we're in that first step able to show that the, the way we were using the ventilator impacted the diaphragm. You might say, well, who cares? I don't treat diaphragms. I, I treat patients. I want to know what actually happens to their clinical outcomes. So we extended uh, this study, including these first 100 patients, and adding another 100 or so so that we could start getting correlations with clinical outcomes. And here's the, the, the primary take-home uh, message here in, in that on any given day, the patients were most likely to be extubated were those whose diaphragm thicknesses were the closest to their baseline. So having your, so we see a, a classic U-shaped curve here where if your diaphragm was either thicker or thinner than it was when you started, there was less of a chance of you getting off the ventilator. Looking at this in a more classical way um, here, in black are patients who had no change in thickness of the diaphragm, and red and, and blue show the more than 10% increase or decrease respectively, and you can see here there's a significant delay in getting off the ventilator when your diaphragm was changed from its uh, baseline status. Again, here a nice U-shaped curve for duration of ventilation associated with changes in diaphragm thickness over time, with both increase or decreases being bad. 
or looking at this another way, the complications of mechanical ventilation, either death, reintubation, duration of ventilation for more than uh, 14 days, or the need for a tracheostomy, all being associated with uh, changes in your diaphragm. And more than that, it's related to the diaphragm activity as well. So patients who were breathing in that sweet spot of sort of normal amounts of respiratory effort uh, had the shortest duration of ventilation. So we put together this story about diaphragm injury or my, uh, myotrauma, if you, uh, if you like, to, uh, to keep similar vernacular as our ventilator-induced lung injury. And we start off with acute respiratory failure resulting in the need for mechanical ventilation. But in many cases, we have patients who are making either insufficient or excessive respiratory efforts. This then leads, leads to alterations in the diaphragm structure that are mediated through the amount of effort that the patient's making. And ultimately, this causes problems for our patients because of, uh, with difficulty from liberation from mechanical ventilation that's, uh, again, mediated by changes in the thickness of the diaphragm and we think resulting from impairment of their diaphragm function. So I think there's a growing evidence of the role of uh, ventilation and iatrogenic diaphragm dysfunction. We like the term myotrauma as a nice uh, uh, term to, to coin for this. We have new data linking diaphragm activity to diaphragm atrophy to clinical outcomes. And that makes us think about, okay, what about muscle protective ventilation strategies? The broader implications of this are to minimize ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. We should minimize asynchrony so that we, ha to, so we don't have these dangerous eccentric contractions. We need to, mon to measure and monitor patient efforts so we know where they are in that, uh, that U-shaped curve and then consider strategies that might help move them towards more normal levels of effort, uh, either increasing or decreasing ventilatory, ventilatory support. Which then begs the question, how do we measure effort? We talked about this uh, in our mechanical ventilation workshops yesterday a little bit. And the truth is, while many of us can recognize a patient who's really working hard, um, it can be very tricky to, to know whether a patient is making too little, just the right, or maybe a little bit too much effort. And, there, and here you really need to have some objective data. There's many ways to do this, and I'll just go through uh, them quickly here. We may use an esophageal balloon. We could measure the, the uh, occlusion pressure in the first uh, 100 milliseconds, the P.1. We can do another airway occlusion test. We can use proportional assist ventilation, or we could use diaphragm ultrasound, as I've shown before. Esophageal manometry is being more and more used these days. And simply when you, uh, if you have one of these esophageal balloons in, you can look at the, the pressure swings that the patient is generating uh, with their spontaneous efforts and, dis and judge directly how, how much PMUS they're generating. The P.1 is an old measurement, but again, is, in, is coming back in, in favor. It, this is non-volitional and indicative of the amount of effort that the amount of drive that the patient has. So normal values of about minus one to minus three, things significantly less than minus one suggest that your patient is over assisted and maybe just barely triggering the ventilator. And very low, very negative values suggest that the patient really is working hard and may benefit, at least from a diaphragmatic standpoint, from some more assistance. I'm just gonna skip over this expiratory occlusion man uh, maneuver. We could use proportional assist ventilation, which measures work of breathing, and then by knowing what the ventilator is doing, we can figure out what the patient is doing. If 50% support on PAV on the ventilator is generating 10, centi 10 centimeters of water, then I assume that the patient is also doing, doing about 10 centimeters of water effort, which is just in the upper level of this five to 10 centimeter water of uh, sweet spot that I wanna try and get patients into. And of course, we can measure the uh, thickening fraction, as I was showing you earlier. How to treat over-assistance myotrauma? The ventilator's doing too much work, the patient's not doing enough, okay? Reduce the support of the ventilator. Pay attention and try to, uh, to titrate these things appropriately. When, uh, when the patient has, when damage has already been done, we might think about diaphragmatic pacing. This is not yet available for uh, for use in, human, in humans, but uh, might be coming down the pipeline, a, a cool uh, strategy from Steve Reynolds in Vancouver using a device that 
is inserted like a subclavian line and provides pacing for the phrenic nerve. And at least in pig models, they've been able to show that this can prevent disuse atrophy. And when atrophy is already set in, you might try some inspiratory muscle training. It was most efficiently given by a threshold loading, just by putting the patient on pressure triggering and turning the pressure trigger uh, up significantly. Doing this for 10 or 20 breaths a couple times a day. Um, we don't have great outcome data yet, but at least there's some physiological data to say that this may actually be helpful in, in improving diaphragm function. Last couple of slides thinking about treating under assistance myotrauma. This can be trickier because now we're getting into the balance of preventing ventilator induced lung injury versus, uh, versus ventilator induced diaphragm dysfunction. But you might, if they're under assisted, you might in consider increasing the, uh, the inspiratory assist on the ventilator. Often you'll find that there is no change in tidal volume because the patient's already driving much of this tidal volume with their own efforts. Increasing PEEP can sometimes actually help damp down high drive to breathe because of uh, changes in receptors within the lung. You might consider neuromuscular blockade in this setting, but then we're, we're trading over assist for under assist. You might consider partial neuromuscular blockade. This is a, uh, the idea that a patient self-inflicted lung injury really may be, may be driving not just diaphragm injury, but also ventilator-induced lung injury. And um, again, this group from uh, Amsterdam and Leo Hunks have shown that you can, by carefully titrating small doses of neuromuscular blockade, they were able to keep patients breathing spontaneously, but nicely reduce their tidal volumes. And finally, one more thing that we may use would be extracorporeal CO2 removal. May not, maybe not full-blown ECMO for this, but trying to reduce CO2 to reduce drive and keep patients in that sweet spot of breathing spontaneously, using their diaphragm to the right amount, but not uh, injuring their lungs with very large tidal volumes. More to come on that in uh, this afternoon's talk uh, about how to use the, how the ventilator and the circuit interact. Four take-home points. Um, how, we use the, how we use the ventilator impacts diaphragm function, which in turn impacts clinical outcomes. I, I think the pa measuring patient effort on the ventilator is important. We want to try and minimize asynchrony and avoid disuse and excessive efforts. And with that, I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. Thank you.